This is about power and influence. The silence on the part of all of these climate-friendly companies is not neutrality, it's complicity. It's complicity with those who want to preserve the status quo, and the status quo is what's driving us all off this climate cliff. Welcome back to Responsible Impact, a production of Magic Links. We connect brands and influencers, and so this is the show where we take a good look at all things sustainability and e-commerce. You've heard about voting with your dollars, including on this show, but what about voting with your job search? What about voting with your upper management, HR, and C-suite? Especially in the wake of Citizens United, corporations use their spending and voice in the political sphere to shape public policy and almost always in ways they want to see it. They do this because in the end, it works. So at what point do employees and others with ties to companies look leadership in the eye and campaign for better? Seriously. Bill Wiles pivoted his career, which we'll get into, and is now the founder of Climate Voice. He helps guide us through the context around corporate responsibility to influence overdue public policy changes, as well as how we as individuals in relation to companies can help steward this change for the betterment of us all. Plus, he's just a lovely guy. Hang tight. Here we go. So I'm Bill Weil, and I am the founder of Climate Voice, which we started in February of 2020. Our focus is on uh, educating and mobilizing the workforce to encourage companies to go all in on climate. And all in means all the great work that many companies are doing now on buying clean energy, going carbon neutral, et cetera. And in addition, and especially using their clout, their influence to push for meaningful climate policies. You know, I'm, I'm working on climate because I think it is, it's an existential crisis. Yeah. And living here in California, the last three years, we had fires that were insane. This year, We learned what insane really is. The fire Mm -hmm. season here started six weeks early. We had seven, eight weeks of air where you didn't want to go outside. Bad enough that this year we're not supposed to be around other people, but then we actually couldn't even really leave the house. And that's kind of the new normal, unprecedented hurricane season on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. So so it's, it's not just this distant future crisis. It's here today and going to get worse. But we can choose how bad it gets. We can continue down the business as usual path and it will be horrific. Or we can choose to act and transition rapidly to a low carbon, ultimately zero carbon society and we'll be in a much, much better place. That is the thing that keeps me going. I think people should have hope that we can change things. It's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to happen necessarily quickly. Public policy is hard and slow, but then it can change. This is something that that should give us all a lot of hope. Talk about why you are emphasizing so much the role and responsibility of corporations. Well, I so, so I would say I'm emphasizing the role of public policy and the need for companies to play a role in making that happen. And there are a lot of people who focus on individual responsibility, whether it's to vote, but also to make better choices, that people should do the things they can do in their own own lives to reduce their impact. And that's important. It's not an either or. I think it's improv. It's yes and. But we are not going to make the changes we need to address the climate crisis at the speed and scale we need to make them without public policy. That's sort of the starting point. The question is then, how do we get it? And whose responsibility is it to help make that happen? Yeah, indeed. And companies, corporations, especially large ones, have a lot of influence in our current political policymaking governance system. They mostly use that influence for their own good. And when an issue doesn't directly affect them, they stay silent. So the companies that are directly affected by climate, some companies like Mars, for example, the candy and pet food company, they've got an extensive agricultural supply chain. And one of the key things they sell is chocolate. Chocolate is 
um, the is is threatened by climate change because it grows in a, a narrow band of climate zones. And as the climate gets more variable and things shift, chocolate is like, like and I'm a chocoholic, so this is of particular interest to me. Same. Um, chocolate is likely to be less, less available. So Mars, because climate is going to affect their business, is actually very involved in pushing for public policy on climate. All of the fossil fuel companies are very heavily affected by climate and, and really by climate action, because if we take the kind of aggressive, bold action on climate that we need to, the fossil fuel companies are going to see their businesses shift. Their businesses will either shrink or change dramatically. And it's kind of up to them which of those happens. But they have been reacting to that by fighting climate policy now for decades. Other companies, the ones I, so I, I worked for Google for about six years as their green energies are. I worked for Facebook for six years as their director of sustainability. In both cases, climate was a big part of my portfolio, if you will. Most companies, my former employers included, that are not energy companies, climate policy doesn't affect them much one way or the other. I mean, very long term, we're all affected, or I would argue actually not so long term anymore. We are all affected by climate change. It's a systemic risk that affects everybody. But the scale of impact of climate, at least in the next 5, 10, 20 years on most companies, is nothing like the impact of other public policy issues they wrestle with. So they choose to stay on the sidelines. They're silent. We want to change that. When you think about what it takes to bring people into the fold who, like you're saying, are staying out on the sidelines, what comes to mind is the most important motivators or missing pieces of information that help kind of get them to jump in? It would be great if we could convince companies they should, they should act altruistically. And most companies, <laughs> I think, just won't do that. Um, it's it's, it's a sad and, you know, most people at some level, there's some amount of self-interest. It's what makes an issue resonate with you. And there are a few CEOs and boards that have decided that climate is really a, a crisis and that their companies are going to really engage Unilever, Mars, Ikea, Patagonia. Salesforce actually recently has gotten more and more engaged. Most companies are engaging enough to do some good and to take the pressure off and to lead relative to almost everybody else. And then that's it. And they're not doing what we need. They're doing what feels doable and possible. So to change that, you know, we can try to appeal to their, their sense of morality, their rationality by talking about how the climate crisis is getting worse and worse and, and our opportunity to act is shrinking and we can hope that will work with some of them. But I think the, the way we can really get them to move more quickly is by making it something that is relevant to their business today. How are you making that happen? The way we are going about that, we've been inspired by what happened in the fights for LGBT rights, where companies went from being on the sidelines on public policy, uh, the, uh, pr companies that were very progressive, leading on gay rights in their operation, but were silent on public policy, got off the sidelines and spoke up on public policy because their employees demanded it and because they were convinced that young people in college, the people they wanted to hire next year and the year after and so on, thought it was a no-brainer. And for those people, it was a basic civil rights issue. Yeah. And so what we are working to do is educate employees and students about the role that corporate influence plays in policy issues like climate and about how the silence on the part of all of these climate-friendly companies is not neutrality, it's complicity, it's complicity with those who want to preserve the status quo. And the stat status quo is what's driving us all off this climate cliff. Yep. Um, and as we educate people about that, you can just see the light bulb going off where they realize, wow, you know, our political system is broken in a lot of ways. There are a lot of things we need to do to fix it. But given the system we have at the moment, there's a lot that can be done within it to drive change rapidly on issues like climate, and in particular, getting corporate influence 
to put into play on on the right side of the issue is a huge opportunity. Do you find that there's a common sort of recalcitrance or or kind of like a guardrail that you keep coming up against? And the, and and what are your answers to that? I'm th- I'm trying to put myself in the mind of somebody who's listening, and they're like, God, I would love to take this to my corporation and ask them to do this, but they're probably going to say X, and then how do I counter that? Right? Yeah. Well, I think there are. Um, there are several. One is, well, it's not our issue. You know, we're not an energy yeah. company, so we shouldn't land on energy policy. We're not a car company or a transportation company, so we shouldn't weigh in on that. Or we don't build a lot of buildings. You know, in some ways that's fair. The problem is, I would draw the analogy to if you and your listeners are familiar with the anti-bullying literature. People talk about bystanders and upstanders. And so bystanders are good people who don't beat other people up. And, you know, they're, they're fine, upstanding people, but they're standing on the sidelines. And upstanders are people who have power and the ability to change things, who step in and intervene and help stop the bullying that's going on. The same thing is true this year with the enormous attention on racial injustices and oppression. People have talked about not being racist versus being anti-racist. I think the same analogy holds here. It's not enough. If we're going to solve climate change, it's not enough for most powerful institutions to sit back and say, we're good people. We're not polluting. You know, we're net zero. So please leave us alone. That is no longer enough. That 10 years ago was huge leadership because almost nobody was doing that. But today we need the public policy, not just that individual action by individual companies and individual people. To get that, we need those with power and influence to get off the sidelines and stand up to the very powerful entities that have mostly been pushing in the wrong direction. So one argument is just to reiterate that. Another is to say when, you know, sometimes the pushback is, oh, we we lobby all the time on climate. And then there'll be a list of 10 things that they've lobbied on. What they're not mentioning is the 50 other things that they were silent on. And half of the 10 things they mentioned are probably from five years ago. So we are with another group called Influence Map, which publishes a scorecard of companies on how they use their influence on climate. In the next few months, we'll be releasing much more detailed data on how companies do and don't use their influence. And most companies, most of the climate-friendly companies, are much quieter on climate than they would like you to believe. So there's, there's going to be a little bit of a put up or shut up. If you're saying you're, you're so wonderful on climate, then they're going to have to actually step up and act that way because the data will be very obvious when they're not. And that touches on something or it feels like it sort of shares a room with something that we talk a lot about on our more sort of consumer based conversations on this show, which is greenwashing. Um, and I me sort of watching it and talking about it with all these different actors, I find that there's such an issue because there is no common metric, right? So like I can tell how many calories are in one food item versus another, but it's so difficult to know who's being a good actor or who's being genuine, especially if an organization has increasingly complex operations or supply chains or relationships, right? Um, So this is really fascinating to me to think that in a way there's almost like this standardization being brought to this facet of, of action. I'm really excited to see this. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, having done a lot of this work for the last 15 years inside companies, I bristle when it's called greenwashing, but at a certain point, what might've seemed like leadership or what was leadership five or 10 years ago, in terms of what we need today, uh, maybe at some level greenwashing. 15 years ago, You know, if a company said, we're going to put a megawatt of solar on the roof of our headquarters, Google put in 2006, 2007, put 1.6 megawatts of solar on its Mountain View headquarters. It was incredible. I think it might have been the biggest, biggest corporate installation of solar in the U.S. ever. And today, I think if, if a company announced that, people say, well, that's nice. But you had companies that say, we've got solar on 30 buildings. They didn't say how many buildings they had. Yeah. They didn't say what percentage of their overall energy came from solar. They, they, they put forward some examples of some really good things they were doing, but didn't put it in context. And I think the same thing is true, is needed on 
how companies use their influence, their lobbying, their political contributions, their uh, membership in trade associations, some of which are good on climate, some of which are pretty bad, that we need not just the marketing spin on here are the 12 things that we've done that are good, but really the report that says here are all the things, here's what's good, here's what's bad, here's what's silent, which is actually pretty bad. And I don't think we're going to get that so directly from the companies just through self-reporting. So that's where groups like Influence Map come in because they're doing a lot of deep research through many, many sources to ferret out how are companies using their influence and what's good and what's bad about it. We had talked about something before this where you said that physics isn't going to wait. For somebody who's like, the what now? Dive into that, would you? Yeah. um, I think a lot of times, especially in Silicon Valley, I talk to people who are very excited about various technologies. Most, many of the people will have a particular technology or, or climate solution they are very excited about. They often tend not to think about, and how long will it take for that solution to get to the scale it needs to be to have a really serious impact? These solutions will scale and will take over the market over time. Wind and solar are cheaper than other ways of generating electricity in many, if not most, places around the world today. Um, So eventually, the market will do the right thing. The problem is that word, eventually. And that's where I say physics isn't going to wait for eventually. It's not going to wait for the market to transform the economy to zero carbon So we need to cut emissions rapidly. We can't wait for some magic innovation to come along, uh, whether that's direct air capture or fusion or advanced fission or whatever that might save the day. All those things might actually help a lot. The only problem is we don't know when. And the risk of just waiting for one of them to show up in scale is just much too large. It means that we're courting and, and in fact, I think likely to end up with catastrophe. I know a lot of folks are living their own lives and they're sort of on their own paths. And I think that part of the hesitation that we also see from folks in getting more involved in climate or speaking up even in their, their offices is that they're like, well, but I'm not a climate person. I'm not a science person. I'm an accountant. I'm a this, I'm a that. And you kind of came in a little bit, you jumped into this to some extent, right? Yep. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Cause so let's talk about if you would just briefly, whatever you feel like sharing about how you started and how you came into this and what drove that, like the heart space that you were coming from. Yeah. So I started my career in computer science. I was uh, honestly, you know, growing up, I was an environmentalist of a sort I was aware of environmental issues. My mom, especially, I think, was really an environmentalist at heart. You know, I grew up in the in Cincinnati in the sixties and seventies. We recycled, we composted. Neither of those was easy to do then in the the suburbs of a city like Cincinnati. And I suffered through horrific air pollution, especially in the summer, from the manufacturing and power plants around there. But in school, I was good at math and science. I kind of fell into computer science. It was fun. It was new. It was interesting. And I was good at it. So that was just a natural career path that I followed for a long time. And then in 2004, I'd been hearing about climate for, at that point, probably eight or 10 years and getting increasingly concerned about it. I realized as I was thinking about leaving the job I was in at the time that What I was thinking about in my spare time, sometimes at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep, wasn't some hard technical problem at work that I, you know, 10 years earlier, I might have been wrestling with, you know, kind of in the shower or whatever. It was climate change and wondering what kind of world we were going to leave for my kids, for their generation, for poor people around the world. And that's what prompted me to make what was a pretty big shift. Um, I was lucky enough to land a job at Google. I spoke their language. I understood their business. I understood the technology that they used to run the business. So I could bridge the core of the company to the community of people, mostly outside the company, who understood energy and climate and so on. And they were willing to hire me, trusting that I could learn learn what I needed to know since there was a lot that I, I didn't. I think one of the things I've realized in the last few years is that it doesn't matter whether you're a computer scientist or an accountant or in marketing or a lawyer or whatever, 
you can have impact on climate in many ways in your life. You can also be an advocate in whatever institutions you're part of. And, you, you know, the, the place where you work is a really important one. Employees can really affect what a company does beyond what it does in its own operations. You can affect what it does in its supply chain. So you can push it to choose suppliers that are paying more attention to the climate. And you can push it to speak up in favor of climate policies. Big companies especially, they have government affairs teams, they have teams of lobbyists, they have outside firms they hire. They have the resources if they prioritize it. Mostly, they have not invested very much. If employees speak up and if they speak up together, our belief is that will begin to shift. And, and what we're doing with Climate Voice is giving people a way to raise their voice collectively and tell employers we care. And then we are developing tools that employees can use internally, uh, talking points that they can use when they go talk to executives and so on to start to shift what their company is doing. Talking about different companies who say, you know, let's say they listen and they're like, you know what, we're doing it. We're getting involved. Are there particular things that you think need more areas of, I don't want to say the fight, but for lack of a better phrase, you know, areas of the fight where you're like, actually, we could really use enforcements if people want to get involved on, let's say, energy or, you know, environmental racism. Are there, I mean, I know they're all very important and they're all very interlinked, but are there certain things that come to the fore for you where you're like, if you're going to pick one, you know, come sit here? Um, well, my first plea would be don't don't pick just one because, um, and, and I'll explain Fair. why. This is about power and influence um, fundamentally. And the fossil fuel companies, the folks who've been working to maintain the status quo, they're not picking one. They are putting their combined might in the fight against all of these. If companies that care about the issue pick one, and each company picks one of 20 different things, then what we'll find is that you've got all of the power of the fossil fuel companies on the other side and a few companies sitting over here on this side. So, so that's why you know, the first point would be find a way to act together with other companies and don't pick just one. Number two, if you talk to economists, there's been a push for a long time that what we need is in economic terms to price the externality. An externality in economic terms is something that happens in the course of business that the business is imposing a cost on society, but is not paying for it. So, so the cost is externalized. Society pays for it. So one way to address that is to say, let's make the polluters pay. Let's price the externality. And then people will start to choose a less polluting thing to do. The problem with that, there, there are a lot of problems. One is it raises the cost of many things that we all do every day. It doesn't change behavior, I believe, anywhere near fast enough for some of the changes we need to make. Uh, so it's not just a price on carbon. I would encourage people to look for things that directly solve the problems we are addressing. And, and those really fall into three categories. So one is there are standards, um, standards for the kind of energy that we consume. So we want to consume clean energy that doesn't pollute, that doesn't produce you know, greenhouse gas emission. Bills like <clears throat> Virginia earlier this year passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act. Climate Voice pushed companies to support it. And it basically mandates 100% clean energy on the Virginia grid by mid-century. It's a huge step forward. And the fact that, you know, a dozen non-energy companies supported that made a huge difference. So standards are one part. The second part, and especially today, you know, this has been, this has been a really strange, strange, weird, horrific year with the pandemic. And what it's done to the economy has been devastating. We're going to need to spend a lot more money over the next couple of years to continue to keep people afloat. Um, as we get through this pandemic and then to help recover. And we have a choice as we spend trillions more of public money. Do we spend it basically to prop up the economy as it's been, or do we spend it in a way that will help build the economy the way we want it to be? The third piece, which I think companies should be paying attention to, is justice. 
Mm-hmm. It's been true for a long time, but I think everyone's eyes have been opened this year to how intersectional these issues are and how climate solutions are tied in with climate justice. It's tied in with environmental justice, tied in with racial justice. We need policies that address climate and address justice at the same time. So those are the three standards, investment, and justice, I'd say, that that companies should be looking for. Please help explain the ways that money and influence stem from corporations, big and small. Large companies make political contributions. They have PACs. Their executives make political contributions. And I've seen some articles recently about how some of the big tech companies, which talk a lot about climate, they don't weigh in much on climate policy. But then when you look at their political contributions, they contribute to both sides, as they like to say, you know, where they don't take sides very much. And they've contributed a lot to climate deniers and people you might call climate obstructionists, people who get really bad scores from the various environmental organizations that rate legislators and other elected officials. Their political contributions are running counter to what they profess on climate. That needs to change. And smaller companies, you know, they may not put much directly into political contributions, but many of them are members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or other trade associations. And many trade associations, certainly the big ones like the U.S. Chamber, put a lot of money into politics. And they do that on behalf of their members. Their members need to speak up and be clear that they don't want that money given to climate deniers, climate obstructionists, and so on. So yeah, you know, where companies' money goes in politics, it's not just what they lobby on, it's also where the money goes. And sometimes it's their money, sometimes it's the money that their trade associations control on their behalf. Tell me what you think. I'm really riffing here. But if I'm looking for a new job, that one of the things that I now need to as a responsible climate citizen do is check the political donations of both the company and its top executives against any sort of database for political contributions. Because, you know, if I end up taking a job at a place only to find out that I'm now, you know, because that's the thing is once you have a job, you feel like you're sort of part of the institution. You worry about how it will look to leave. You worry about being like a squeaky wheel. Sounds like finding out and doing your research on the company's true climate agenda before you accept a position or not sounds like a good habit to start forming. I I completely agree. You should be looking into their political contributions. You should be looking into their lobbying. That's part of what we with Influence Map and other organizations are trying to make make that information more accessible to people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's still a long way to go, but but it's a question you should be asking. You should be asking them in job interviews and at career fairs because. If the recruiters who show up on campus, and these days that would be virtually, but, but <laughs> yeah. you know, there, are, there are virtual career fairs, if they hear students asking, who do you contribute to you know, in po- terms of political contributions? Who do your executives contribute to? Um, how many of those people are you know, climate champions versus climate obstructionists? What do you lobby on on climate? Um, and, and if they hear that people care about this issue, you know, that information will, will, will percolate back to the mothership and, you know, the, the recruiting HR organization will hear about it and that will filter out to the rest of the, the other executives in the company. If they hear about it enough, that will begin to change the way that they behave. And that coupled with, with the discussions we have directly with companies and the work we're doing to engage and mobilize employees and students, I think that the more, you know, we're, we're creating a drumbeat where yeah. companies are hearing that people care and it's going to affect where they choose to work. That will make companies sit up and take notice. What are any other parting insights that you can share with us? The other thing that is, I would say, much earlier stage in the transformation we need to make, but as a result, really important, is the shift to eliminate emissions from buildings. So in California, we burn as much natural gas in buildings, in commercial and residential buildings. I'm not talking about 
factories, but you know, just for heating, hot water, cooking, other kind of miscellaneous uses. We burn as much natural gas in buildings as we do in power plants. What? Yeah, crazy, right? It's not a stat I knew until about a year and a half ago, um, and it and it just kind of you know made my jaw drop. So there are a modest number, you know, dozens of power plants that burn natural gas, but they're enormous. There are, I think, 120 million dwelling units in the U.S., something like that, maybe a little more, um, half of which burn natural gas. So the amount of natural gas each one burns is modest, but there are a lot of them. And then lots of commercial buildings. So we are not going to fit a carbon capture device on the stove in my house or in your house or on our furnace, probably ever, but certainly not Mm -hmm. anytime soon. We need to stop building new buildings that emit greenhouse gases. So we need to stop building new buildings that burn natural gas, propane, other fossil fuels. Because everyone we build is something that then for the next 20, 30, 50 years is going to emit carbon dioxide. And it's going to mean that, it, you know, as we keep building more of them, we have to expand the infrastructure that distributes that natural gas, which is, in fact, something that, that is an investment that typically will last for 50 or 100 years. We're building additional infrastructure that is locking in carbon emissions for a long time to come. We're essentially digging the hole that we're in deeper every time we build one of those buildings. We need to stop. And then we need to start figuring out how do we, in a fair, just, equitable way, retrofit the existing buildings like the house I live in, which has natural gas, so that they stop emitting Mm -hmm. greenhouse gases. That's not simple, but the technology is there today for it to make good economic sense to build all electric zero emissions buildings. But it's going to take public policy to drive this and to drive it quickly. And the natural gas industry, as you can imagine, is fighting this tooth and nail. Charming. And we need other businesses to step up and say, actually, this is the right thing for our economy. It's the right thing for climate. It's the right thing for our employees and the people, the communities that we serve, and to step up and support it. Hmm. How can we support that? Um. You can write letters. You can call the governor. There's an organization called the Building Decarbonization Coalition that you can find by Googling it or using your favorite search engine. I guess I shouldn't be be too (laughs) Google-centric. The Sierra Club and others have been involved in rallying support for it. But basically, letters to the California Energy Commission, to the governor, or, or phone calls will help make clear that there is public support, but also getting your company, if you're employed by a company or some other institution, to do the same. We need businesses, not just individual you know, citizens, to stand up and support it. Okay, so people hear this, they're like, I want to go help. I want to get involved. Climatevoice.org and go there. There's a pledge we ask you to sign. We're revamping the format. The pledge looks a little daunting. Uh, take the time to read it. We're, we're working to revamp it, but that's going to take a little while. But go there, sign the pledge and the petitions that are on the site with it. And then there's a resources page that now has actually, I think, uh, at least a half dozen, maybe more resources, questions you can ask at, at job interviews or at career fairs if you're a student, ways in which you can engage if you're an employee at your company and so on, a policy guide for business leaders. So if if you're a business leader or you want to convince your management, your company to support policy, there's a policy guide that lays out the kinds of policies that they should be supporting. In the same part of your brain where you remember to buy more milk or coffee, I need you to put this reminder front and center Visit climatevoice.org and get involved. Climatevoice.org. Listen, if corporations are a loud political voice, and if people can lead a successful company, then they have the right mix of skills and resources to lead on climate change. Fundamentally, it's that simple. Go make it happen, y'all. Credits this episode go to Hazel Shin, Brian Nickerson, Asheen Fun say yes from episode four. For those of you who remember, he connected me with Bill. Thank you again. Autumn Collins, who makes the episode art we all love so much. 
and the fearless, clear-eyed Bill Weil. All right, gang, I'm Natalie, and I'm out. Till next time.